Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the gift of your word that reveals you to us. We confess sometimes that we neglect your word, which is a primary way that we relate to you and that you reveal yourself to us. So we ask, Lord, that today we could give attention to the words of your scripture, that we might know the word of God as it has been revealed to us in the person of your Son, Jesus Christ, who's come out of love for the world and for your people. Let us know and believe and trust these things today. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Numbers, chapter 21. We'll pick up in verse 4. Numbers 21, verse 4. And I invite you to hear this word. From Mount Hor they set out by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, but the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bidden shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole. And whenever a serpent bent someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our second reading this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 3. We'll begin in verse 14. John 3, 14. Hear this word. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, And people loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts find acceptance in your sight, Almighty Father, for it is you who are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This passage from John is extraordinarily familiar for folks who've grown up in the church. When Bible Gateway did a map a few years ago to show which verses everyone had searched for in each state the most, they actually left out John 3.16 because the map would have been boring with every state practically saying John 3.16. So they excluded that one so they could see what the second most popular verse was in most places. Some years, Bible Gateway has, has data for not just which, which verses have been searched and read the most, but, but also which ones have been highlighted and commented on the most. And what's fascinating is that though John 3.16 is the, the most searched and read, it doesn't ever make it into those lists that's highlighted or, or notated about. It's our favorite verse. It's everyone's favorite verse. It's super common and yet 
we don't really think it's worthy of our attention. We can quote it, it, it's written everywhere. But when we read it this morning, I wonder if you shut down a little bit and thought, I've heard this sermon before. I know this passage fairly well. Jesus speaks these words to Nicodemus, a religious leader among the Jews who's, who's come to Jesus at night to ask Jesus the questions about the secrets of the kingdom of God and eternal life. He says, I, I know that you must be the real deal because of the signs that you're doing. But he doesn't come to Jesus in the daytime. He comes at night. As he comes at night, Jesus says, the only people that will see the kingdom of God are those who have been born again. And Nicodemus says, what does that mean? And Jesus says, if you don't understand earthly things, how are you going to understand heavenly things? And then he offers Nicodemus this explanation. That just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so also must the Son of Man be lifted up so that the world might have eternal life for those who believe in Jesus. It's it's all right here in this passage, this verse, these two verses, 16 and 17, capture the heart of the gospel. It's a beautiful summary of the gospel. And to understand it, we've got to go all the way back to Numbers. In Numbers, the the people of Israel are reaching the end of their journey through the wilderness. They've They've been traversing through the wilderness for 40 years, often moving in circles, often frustrated about their circumstances, regularly complaining that they'd rather go back to Egypt than keep up what they're doing. And early in the story, when they complain, they they say, Moses, you've brought us out into the desert to starve. And the Lord provides manna each morning and quail for them to eat. And their needs are met. And several times in the story, they say, Moses, you've brought us out here into the desert to die of thirst. There's no water or the water that we have is bitter. And God provides good, pure water to drink to the people of Israel. And so now as they end their journey, they've, they've gotten bored of the miracles of God. The, the manna that shows up each morning is, is no longer interesting to them. They, they don't want anything to do with that food. So much so that their complaining has become illogical. There's... There's no bread, they say. There's no water. And and the bread doesn't taste any good. It's obvious that they're just complaining to complain. They say there's no bread, but then they follow it up and say, well, well, maybe there is bread, but we just don't want to eat it anymore. God's faithfulness has been so reliable that they've become bored. They're tired of packing up camp each morning and carrying on their way and setting camp up again each night. They're tired of eating the same manna from heaven each day, even if, even if it is a magical miracle of God. New day, same grind, and they're exhausted, and it feels like death to them. Why did you bring us out of Egypt to die here? In the middle of nowhere. So God hears their complaints and this time he doesn't send manna or quail. He sends serpents. Fiery serpents. The the word for poisonous here in the Old Testament is the same word for fire. This is the word that gets used to describe the angelic beings that Isaiah sees in Isaiah 6. The seraphim. They're they're burning, flaming spiritual creatures that Isaiah Isaiah sees. And here they're described as seraphim serpents, burning serpents. And the spiritual meaning of, of what's happening here is obvious. It goes all the way back to the serpent in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve listened to the serpent rather than to the Lord. 
These poisonous vipers are a sign of the Israelites' distance from God who is leading them by fire at night and cloud by day exactly where he would have them to go, who has provided them with their every need. And still they complain. What happens as the serpents make their way among the people is terrible. Many people die. And so the, the people of Israel, they go to Moses, and they, rather than pray themselves, they ask for Moses to intercede on their behalf. They say, Moses, will you pray to the Lord that he would take away these serpents? And Moses does. He prays to the Lord on behalf of the people. They say, we, we said bad things about your leadership, Moses. We said bad things about the Lord. We spoke against the whole enterprise, and, and we're sorry. Tell God we've, we've learned our lesson and ask him to take them away. So Moses asks. He does what the people ask him to do. And the snakes don't go away. The prayer that Moses lifts up on behalf of the people isn't answered in the way that they expect. Instead of getting rid of the snakes, God gives them a cure. And the cure looks a whole lot like the disease. Fashion a a serpent and put it on a pole, God says, and when people look up at that serpent, they won't die. It doesn't say they'll never get bitten. It doesn't say the, the serpents won't be around their camp. It just says if they get bitten, if they look at this serpent on the pole, they will live. They'll be well. The threat is still there, but it's no longer deadly. It might hurt, it might burn for a second. There might be searing pain from the bite of a viper, but still they'll they'll survive. Just as you look, as they looked at that bronze serpent, Jesus says, so also must the Son of Man be lifted up. Whoever believes in him may have eternal life. It's such a simple thing to look up at the serpent to be saved. But it also provides the people of Israel with a constant reminder of who God is and their dependence on God to make all things well. Of their entire dependence on God for their lives. We know at this point, because of Israel's history, what would happen if the snakes just went away. People of Israel would go back to complaining to Moses a few days later about how the bread wasn't good enough or the water was bad. The bread makes us want to vomit. We want something else. There'd be no bread or no water or they wouldn't like the bread that they had. Just like this, Jesus says, he's going to be lifted up. Jesus is going to be lifted up on the cross where we have to look at the things that plague us. Where we have to look dead in the eye and see our own sin, our violence, our rejection of God and God's love. And behold, in Christ crucified our salvation. Jesus is going to be lifted up from the tomb where he keeps his wounds, but they cannot overcome his life. We will see him lifted up. Jesus is going to be lifted up into heaven and seated at the right hand of the Father. The one who was mocked as a fraud is going to be revered as the Lord of all creation, the King of the universe. Jesus is going to be lifted up on the cross and from the tomb and to the heavenly places where he will reign. He's going to be lifted up because God loved the world enough to send his son. And whoever looks up to him will receive eternal life. This is the gospel This is the invitation of the good news of Jesus to Nicodemus and to you and to me to behold the Lord who saves us. 
to look at the horrible things that we do to God when he comes to show us his love and in that find salvation. This is the good news of Jesus. Not just that God loves you, though he does. Not just that God will forgive you of the particular sins that you have committed, though he will. But that God loved the whole world enough to send his son to establish a kingdom that you can see if you are born again. But he doesn't eradicate the serpents. Sin and death, the coronavirus and cancer, violence and strife all the day long, all around the world, political tensions and disputes, Arguments over how we ought to live. The serpents aren't gone. And people are perishing in the poison of this world. And someone, someone needs to tell them to look up. To see Jesus, the Son of Man, who has been lifted up. That if you set your gaze on Him, you can live forever. You can have eternal life. We can get so focused on the searing pain of the poison and fire of this world. Or from dodging the vipers that we sense are all around us. that We don't look up to see Jesus. What a tragedy would it be if in the middle of the camp of Israel, there was someone who was bitten by a serpent... And they didn't bother to look up and see that bronze serpent that Moses had fashioned so that they could live. What a tragedy would that be if no one bothered to say, look at the serpent, look at the serpent and you will live. I worry that like the Israelites who were bored with these miraculous things from heaven, the, the manna and the quail and the clean water, that we've grown bored with the word of God. That we can quote John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. We can Quote it, but the delight's not there. That maybe we've forgotten the joy that comes with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That we were dead and now we're alive. That we were blind and now we can see. That we were lost and now we are found. That we were drowning and the Lord has lifted us up. Because we know that we can open up the Bible at any time or, or, or go to the app on our phone and read it, we, we never really get around to it, some of us. We never really get around to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when we hear it, we think, oh, I, I know that already. I don't need to hear it again. Ponce de Leon was a, an explorer And he was looking for something very particular when he sailed across the Atlantic, not sure exactly where he was going or where he would land when he established the community of St. Augustine in Florida. He was looking for the fountain of youth. He was looking for some source of water that if you drank from it or bathed in it, you could live forever. You would stay young and healthy and strong. You could live forever. So he took a whole ship and a crew and raised all the money that was needed to build that ship and fund it and feed the crew. And he set sail into uncharted waters, not sure exactly where he was going to, a a land he didn't understand, trying to find the fountain of youth. All that effort to access eternal life. And here it is right here in these pages that you probably have on your shelf at home. If not, we'll gladly give you a copy. Here it is. So little effort required, and yet we 
or bored with it. Just like the Israelites got tired of the manna, maybe we've gotten bored with God. And when that happens, what it means is that we have fundamentally forgotten the truth of the gospel. We've forgotten what the gospel is really about. We have forgotten how good God has been to us or has promised to be to us if we've not experienced it already. The Israelites, as they continue on their journey, they they don't forget the faithfulness of God anymore as they walk through the wilderness with the serpent. But after they get established in the land of Israel, something else happens. They they keep the serpent, though they're not traveling anymore and not no longer uh, no longer um, facing serpents uh, in their camp. And so, over time, they begin to venerate the serpent. They begin to worship the serpent. And King Hezekiah, as he's reforming things for Israel, he he realizes he's got to take down all the idols and the the worship places that are set up to other gods. As a part of that, specifically, he destroys the bronze serpent that Moses made. Because they had taken what was a reminder of the faithfulness of God, their utter dependence on God, and and they'd made it into something to worship like it was a magical, a magical item all on its own. Whether we forget the faithfulness of God by thinking that he's going to let us perish, or whether we forget the faithfulness of God by putting our trust in things rather than the God who gave them to us, we can go astray in a thousand ways. In the South, there's sometimes this, this overwhelming sense that, that for Christians, you, you haven't heard a real sermon if you haven't gotten a little hair, hellfire and damnation. If there's not some ranting about sin, particularly sins that probably aren't the primary sins facing the congregants on that particular Sunday morning. And those sermons rightly communicate the horror that we should have at the darkness of our world. That the, the world has, has decided that it loves darkness more than light because we don't want our evil deeds to be exposed. But the darkness that is in the world is not the primary message of the gospel. Because Jesus didn't just come to save the ones who are already in the church. Jesus didn't just come to save the ones who've got it all together. Jesus didn't come just to save the ones who remember well and don't speak ill of Moses or of the Lord. Jesus came for the whole world, for all of creation. All that he made, he wants to restore to the glory that it had and surpass it. Because it will be stitched together with his love. Jesus didn't come to offer condemnation. That was already present. The snakes were already in the camp. This is the judgment The light has come into the world. Jesus has come to save the whole world. And all it takes for you to participate in that, all it takes is for you to look up at the one who's been lifted up and to step out, to step out into the light. That's what Jesus invites us to, is to step out into his light and glory. And what's terrifying about that is that when we step out, we know that what we've done is going to be exposed, that our sins are going to be visible, and we think that'll be fatal for us. We think that the poison that is in us from the bite of the serpent that's led us into sin is fatal. What Jesus says happens when we step out into the light is miraculous. That when we step out into the truth, the truth of who we are, which is broken sinners, and the truth of who he is, 
the God of our salvation, the one who has come to save the world, when we step out into his deeds and into the light that he offers, what is seen is the glory of Jesus in us. Our sins are there, but they're not. They're not what's recognizable. What's recognizable is the power of God to save us. Jesus has come to save you. He's come to save me. He's come for the love of the whole world. And he is calling you to step out into his light, to entrust yourself to his glory and his power, to receive his salvation and to share it with others. Looking up to Jesus doesn't get rid of all the serpents. It doesn't get rid of all your problems. It's not going to make everything perfectly easy from this day forward. Everything isn't magically going to go away. But it will give you the one thing that you need. A connection to the Lord. Who has made you. And who loves you. And who longs to give you new life. Jesus' arrival is good news. It's good news that Jesus is lifted up on the cross. It is good news that Jesus is raised from the tomb. It is good news that Jesus is lifted up and ascends to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. It's the kind of good news that you can stake your life on. That if you've been bitten by the evil of this world, harmed of no fault of your own, or actively spoken against God and chosen to pursue other things, Even so, you can stake your life on it. It's simple enough. Look to Jesus and step out into his light. Look to Jesus and step out into his light. And in his light, you will not find things to be boring. You will find the salvation of your soul. Is that the kind of good news you will stake your life on? Have you done that? Will you do that? Or have you, like the rest of the world, grown comfortable in the dark with the snakes? God is calling you out into his light. God wants to save you because he loves the whole world. He hasn't come to condemn you. You are already condemned. He's come to save you. Will you receive it? Will you share it? Let's pray. Lord, we need you. Every hour we need you. We forget so quickly when things are going well how much we need you. And we pray that you would take every trial, every struggle, every sin and broken part of our lives and use it to pull us into your heart. That we would not be ashamed of those things, but that we would trust that in your light, those things, even those things, can become a testament to your power and your eternal life. We want to live forever. Not for our sakes but to abide with you. You are our light. You are our salvation. Whom shall we fear? Amen. This has been a production of More Memorial United Methodist Church. To learn more about our ministries, look us up on Facebook, or visit our website, moorememorialumc.com.